Welcome to Great Power Politics. In today's class, we are looking at the continuation um, of our previous class, but rather than focusing on the relationship between Japan and China, we are looking at the relationship between um, the United States and China. And in this case, uh, specifically at the military relationship between the two um, uh, big countries. Uh, primarily, we know that uh, already from previous classes, the tension between the countries exists, especially in the economic sector, which has manifested itself in recent years uh, with the trade war between both countries. But we also see increasing uh, military tension, uh, specifically in the South China Sea, but also around um, the, the status of Taiwan, uh, which has become uh, increasingly um, um, uh, contested uh, by, by the United States um, and uh, uh, stronger measures have been taken by China. So in this class I would like to evaluate um, the current situation and look at um, prospective um, um, uh, scenarios for the future, what could happen and what kind of order the key factors uh, which influence uh, further development. So I hope you will enjoy this class and I will go right into the slides. Thank you. Well, as I said already in this, uh, in this class, we are really looking at the, the military competition between the United States and uh, China. And we are seeing, on the one hand, um, this is not so much a comparison um, be, uh, of what kind of military capacity the, the different countries have. Um, we have looked at, once we looked at the, at the two countries uh, in more detail, we have kind of covered this already. Um, so this is much more in a discussion about, uh, about theoretical backgrounds maybe and the interdependence between the two countries. So in a way, this is a, is a cartoon by Li Feng, um, which I think depicts quite well the, the Chinese perspective of, um, of American politics in the last, um, I don't know, maybe 50 years. Um, so basically, the United States is kind of as a hegemon is acting in a way that it is um, keeping the whole world at its interest sphere and therefore also really kind of interfering or interfering might be the negative word, but um, um, participating in conflict, uh, in many conflicts around the world and kind of seeing strategic interests in many parts of the world as well. So this has been for a long time being criticized by, by China because it said that um, this kind of leaves no room for other actors um, to be active. Um, and uh, so, so a long kind of advocacy of the Chinese, um, of the Chinese government have been the idea about non-interference, that other countries should not interfere in the domestic uh, um, um, behavior of a certain country and that they should not kind of be, um, that there, there shouldn't be like a, a global police which is kind of deciding what is right and what is wrong, but rather that it should be left to the own devices of the individual countries and also um, or maybe of regional actors as well. Um, this is quite um, important because it also includes the the, the defense of human rights and the defense of um, different uh, um, uh, different political systems. So China being not democratic as well um, and being one of the most frequent human rights violations according to Amnesty International is not keen that there are external observers who kind of criticize state behavior um, as a third party. Uh, and so therefore, uh, they advocate for a very long time already that this should be left to the individual state. Um, if we kind of, um, if we kind of think about this uh, from a US perspective, there are certain worries um, about China. 
And that is an, um, the one thing which is actually kind of um, uh, kind of maybe shown very closely um, on the on the right side is um, the idea that there's a high dependency or like increasing dependency of the United States on China in terms of its economic welfare and its production. So we do have that lots of companies in the West, even though they are maybe profitable and and um, Mm, uh, and and uh, going well, well developed. Still, they are more and more depending on supply chains uh, downstream, which means like on earlier like parts of of, um, of products, etc., uh, which are produced in China. And so, this kind of dependency we have also seen in the recent pandemic. It can be challenging. So, if something happens in China, or for whatever reason, China is deciding that it should not. Um, supply these chains to other actors, like to uh, other countries, then there is a problem. So most of the of the uh, protection uh, equipment, the PPE, so-called PPE, uh, for um, for for covering uh, um, people, um, as well as um, and protecting um, hospital staff during the recent pandemic, is produced in China. And even though technologically Western countries would uh, very well be capable of producing them, in the short run it wasn't possible to get large quantities of these supplies in the light that China actually needed them themselves. So uh, that kind of created a, sh a global shortage of products because they have been produced in China. China was at the one end not um, big because of the uh, severe lockdown, not capable of continuing producing them, but at the same time also needing them uh, within the country and therefore not exporting them anymore. Uh, that highlighted a, 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 global, a strong global dependency on China, which has been known already for a long time, but never been taken so serious because the consequences would be like having more production in Western countries, which is more expensive, or more diversity in kind of um, supply, uh, like uh, getting supplies from different countries, um, let's say in, in the region, like also maybe Southeast Asia, et cetera. Um, so uh, this, is, this is something which uh, the most countries um, acknowledge for a long time, but didn't act on it. In, in the recent pandemic, we saw more action. So, for example, uh, the, the Japanese government uh, under um, Shinzo Abe uh, 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 declared some of the funding uh, um, available for um, countries relocating to other um, and other countries, um, uh, companies relocating their production to other countries outside of China in order to reduce this uh, dependency. The United States is also trying to actively reduce its dependency on the, uh, on China in terms of uh, producing at home in the United States or producing in neighboring countries like uh, Mexico, etc. But this is very difficult. Um, so this kind of dependency is existed. Um, the the top left um, caricature is a little bit different. That is actually. Sorry about this uh, uh, interruption. So basically, uh, what I meant with the two left side, um, the two left side um, character, um, character cultures are, um, are primarily showing how fragile the relationship is between the United States and uh, China. And uh, especially the bottom uh, uh, left one is maybe interesting. Um, to see that it's kind of seen as a card house, that the United States and China have kind of elaborate uh, uh, common uh, relations, but they, they are actually kind of um, built like a card house. And uh, Donald Trump could be the, the actor who is actually kind of bringing it all to a fall by uh, switching on the fan. So the fan could, uh, in this way, would maybe be the trade war or the escalation of the conflict between the two um, countries in general. Okay, but that's just like kind of uh, depicting uh, the 
um, the, the the relationship in in very colloquial terms. Let's see, maybe look a bit back into what uh, theoretical research um, says about this. And I want to kind of highlight here the ideas of uh, John Merzheimer first. And his argument is that China cannot rise peacefully. Why would that be the case? Why can't it uh, rise peacefully? Um, so in a way, I, I read it out and then I discuss it um, just in a second. He's, argue, he's saying that I'm not arguing that China's behavior alone will drive the security competition uh, that lies ahead. The United States is also likely to behave in an aggressive way. So he says that both actors are behaving in an aggressive, it might, uh, or is likely to behave in an aggressive way. Arguably, we see this already in the current trade war and the current escalation about uh, the conflict of Hong Kong and other issues where we see that both actors become more and more assertive. And he continues by saying, the United States labored for more than a century to gain regional hegemony. In regional hegemony, it means the Asian regional hegemony. It, it has made sure that no other great power dominating either Asia or Europe, the way it dominates the Western Hemisphere. So he's basically saying that the United States kind of took a very long time to develop these power positions between the two actors. Uh, between the, the the region and uh, itself, but also within within Europe, and that um, he sees that any kind of expansion of power uh, by the uh, by China would actually lead uh, to a degree uh, to degrees of the power of the United States, uh, and that uh, seems to be um, something which the United States would be um, uh, be very wary about and act aggressively against it as well. So in a way, what he says is that the internet connection is a, a critical point. It's not just that China might, uh, might try to increase its power and therefore become more um, assertive. It's also that the United States tries to escalate it out of fear that it loses its power position within the region. Um, so in a way, um, what, what, uh, um, what uh, Mersheimer says here is that um, that it's not that a peaceful rise cannot happen because um, the aggressive nature of one of the two actors, but that this is a systemic issue. That um, as soon as the power becomes bigger from one side, that the other side will also um, uh, kind of act in, uh, accordingly. Well, Please excuse me the, the interruption here. Um, I got a phone, important phone call, and so I had to kind of interrupt the, the, the lecture for just for a second. Um, but I want to uh, dig right back into it um, and think a little bit more about uh, Mersheimer. So as we said, the, the United States um, worked for quite a long time. Um, so basically, it's more than a century uh, for becoming a regional hegemon in uh, Asia, uh, but also in the, in Europe, uh, but uh, of course for this case, uh, especially in Asia, the the kind of security structure um, the the country has uh, built up is mostly bilateral, and I think we talked about this already beforehand. But that means that um, that the actors, the countries, have. Um, a direct connection to the United States, and often the close um, uh, military ties are based on the on the bilateral relations. Um, so Japan has a security agreement with uh, the United States. Uh, South Korea has a security agreement with the United States, the Philippines, but also um, not a country, but it, um, it, technically speaking, but de facto kind of acting like a country. Uh, Taiwan has a security agreement with uh, the United States. So we do have uh, these kind of security uh, agreements of the different actors in order to kind of um, be protected by the United States. But at the same time, this provides access uh, to the United States within the region and a very high level of presence. Um, so um, this kind of is, is seen, Merzheimer has argued that uh, the, the United States is not willing to give up this um, competitive advantage over any other uh, actor uh, uh, without 
um, without um, striving for, for, for protecting and keeping it. Um, however, what he also argues is along the lines that um, basically looking into history and the kind of looking at the, the rise of the United States within the Western Hemisphere and specifically kind of thinking about the Monroe Doctrine. So just to give you a little bit uh, of feedback um, about the Monroe Doctrine that was um, by President Monroe, um, in, uh, it's kind of dated back to, to 1823 when it um, um, was created, but to kind of voice it officially in this way it was actually done a little bit later. But nevertheless, the idea was that while, especially in South uh, America, um, in Middle America, um, most of the colonies, the Spanish and the Portuguese, etc., were very retrieving, um, the United States um, uh, claimed that it will, at the one hand, guarantee the independence of these, uh, these countries. At the other hand, also say that they, they constitute the sphere of influence of the United States, so they will protect them, but also it will constitute a sphere of influence. Uh, at the same time, um, the Monroe Doctrine also said that they will not interfere in any other co European colonies. But basically what we have is a, a quite interesting situation there. The Monroe Doctrine was kind of uh, formulated um, on the retrieval of the European powers out of, um, of uh, Latin America um, based on this idea that there will be a power vacuum and this will be filled by the United States. Um, and so, so, so if scholars like Mersheimer are wondering whether maybe the, uh, China is actually kind of moving in the same direction, developing its own so-called, maybe something similar to a Monroe Doctrine, that means like if power of the United States becomes less influential in the region, that actually the United, uh, that actually China is kind of um, ex, um, increasing its power within, within the, in the region, and therefore kind of over the longer run is uh, becoming a more dominant power. Um, some scholars argue that the, the idea of uh, redeveloping a silk road is very much in this, in this direction, that it actually uh, kind of develops um, uh, extended uh, power, uh, it provides extended power to, the, uh, to China within this respect. So what um, what he is arguing, um, uh, Murtaugh is arguing, is um, if once China becomes more powerful, it's expected to try to push out the United States of the region, and uh, as, as in, maybe in a similar way, the United States pushed out the uh, Europeans uh, when it increased its power uh, over the Western Hemisphere in the 19th century. So. So basically seeing that there is a mechanism here which leads to in this direction. So if we are kind of assessing this, this kind of idea of power, to power transition theory, how Merzheimer has kind of, or how we de uh, describe here um, Merzheimer, um, there are several questions which we can ask along these lines. The one, maybe the most obvious one, is will, will China overtake the United States in national power? Will it become de facto more powerful than the United States? Yeah, but that is just one of the questions, and it, it, it's clearly uh, and a very important question, but it seems quite far out. We will discuss this in, in a little while, but not necessarily a very immediate situation. Um, but something else is also really interesting along this, and this is, will China seek to overturn the existing international or regional order? Will it work within this framework, the paradigm of the international order, or will it develop its own uh, ideas um, uh, in this way and kind of, uh, kind of reject the, the current global uh, uh, regional order um, and, and build something else? And the last question, I think that is the most kind of dominant, which we have at the moment, will the US and China lead into a new situation, a Cold War situation, where basically both 
both sides are so conflictual that they are that they are not um, and that the different spheres will be completely separated and not develop together anymore, but uh, independently of each other. Uh, that's something which also, if you read newspapers, etc., fear, which is kind of commonly known, um, uh, des uh, described, is uh, that this conflict will escalate. But the first stage of this, um, this escalation is um, that the interests will be kind of um, removed from each other. Having said that, it seems very different in the situation um, during the Cold War between the, uh, the US and uh, the Soviet Union, because the interconnectedness of the, the different spheres of influence at the moment. So the United States, as I mentioned, is heavily depending on, um, on China. China is also heavily depending on the United States and other Western allies as a, um, as a potential market. And so the interconnectedness is much bigger uh, than it was um, during the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States. And therefore, it might be not as likely that this scenario is actually taking place. I would like you to take um, a, sh a second here, pause, and uh, think about what your opinion on these three questions are. And what you and write them down to our Padlet site if um, you find the time. I would really appreciate to to read your thoughts on this issue. If we kind of look economically, um, that uh, actually at one point it's not unlikely that the United States, that China might uh, overtake uh, the United States as a key dominant power, especially in the in the Asian region. Um, so that's not unlikely. But the question here is how much does economic power actually translate in political power as well as um, um, as military power. It's also important to see that the United States will remain richer probably per capita. So the overall economy, China might take over, um, uh, over the United States, but that is also due to its large population, to a much larger population than the United States. Therefore, it's not surprising that its economy becomes the biggest in the world. Having said that, per capita, um, the uh, the Chinese income is uh, um, uh, is much lower and will continue to stay. So there is some. So at the moment, the per capita income is roughly like seven percent of the U.S. per capita income. Um, this will rise and it will become the gap will become much narrower. Uh, but uh, expectations are that it's maybe around 50, 55, uh, um, before I wrote here percent. Uh, in uh, 2050, um, which is still far off uh, the per capita um, income of the uh, of, uh, in the United States, um, so people will still be richer um, in the United States than they are in China. At the same time, the economy can of course grow and become much more more powerful. Then. The other issue is also, of course. Um, what lots of these kind of predictions are, are um, discussing are linear development. And as we know, um, economic development is not linear. First of all, there's an, uh, a slowing of the uh, growth rate of the Chinese growth rate um, already existent. Um, that is because, um, because the production in China is becoming uh, more expensive, so there's less demand for um, um, for, uh, for, for exports, or it's more difficult to, to provide exports. But especially, the, essentially, the most important factor here is the change of democratic, um, demographics. So at the moment, 70% of Chinese are in working age. Um, um, so in a way, these kind of 70% are supporting uh, the people who are older than the working age and can't work anymore, or are younger and not working yet. This will change over time because the one-child policy has actually created, a, and a, combined with a, with a better health system, less uh, mortality rate within, uh, uh, within in China, has created a situation which you are all very well familiar, um, that people become older and the proportion of uh, non-working um, uh, uh, population towards working population 
is becoming less favorable. So the, there will be an increase in the support of the especially older age uh, generation and subsequently the Chinese population is shrinking. Um, and the one child uh, policy is not existent anymore as we as we know um, but it doesn't mean that necessarily the population is growing again um, lots of people come from one child families and by now after a, a long period when this was the, the norm see it also as a, as a favorable way of uh, having a family so the population growth is very slow in china as well um, and migration is another way to deal with um, um, with, uh, with a uh, huge age pyramid like this. Uh, however, migration is not as strong in, in China either. Um, so we will face a continuous problem, or China will face continuous problems with this. So we expect that the, that the growth rate will slow down. Another factor which is really important, and I think I will discuss this a little bit later, is uh, events, uh, external events, which cannot uh, necessarily be controlled. So what are the consequences of the current pandemic? Does it change supply structures on a global level? Does it change the, um, the perception of uh, China or um, even the perception of the United States? And what kind of domestic impact does this uh, pandemic have on China? Does it change um, the consumption habits of Chinese, et cetera, et cetera? So, um, such kind of very severe external um, effects uh, might also change um, a common economic pattern. And so it is very hard to kind of see a, a real kind of prediction of where, uh, where um, Chinese economy will be in the world. But the expectation, the overall expectation that it will be, the gap between the United States and China will narrow is quite likely to happen. Okay, here on this slide, we do have this kind of, uh, um, uh, I just wanted to combine this idea of right? uncertainty. Uncertainty is really high in these kind of uh, predictions. And we should be careful uh, with putting too much value in them. So the first one is that the economic trends can happen, uh, can change rapidly. Um, uh, so this can happen by external events like the pandemic or other forms of, uh, um, of financial uh, crisis, economic crises. Um, and this is, if we kind of look back to the 1990s, nobody has at that time it predicted the stagnation of the, uh, of the Czech and Chinese economy or rapid growth of the Indian economy. That was something which wasn't really kind of uh, seen at that time, uh, but, um, but events actually led to kind of a completely different um, different development in the 1990s and the, the beginning of this century, then lots of economists were discussing beforehand because these ex external events uh, led um, to, to different developments. So in a way, the same thing can happen uh, with the situation of, uh, of China. It can either kind of lead to a rapid kind of uh, decrease in economic development or an acceleration. So we really don't know. We have to kind of take into consideration that we're very uncertain about uh, about these events. Um, I had the military balance. Um, I don't want to talk too much about it. I, I put it in here and then hope you can read it. Um, but um, we discussed this much more in our, in our last um, uh, class. And the main idea here is basically that overall um, the comparison is uh, strongly in favor of the United States. The United States is generally uh, better equipped um, militarily and more uh, and dominant within the region, but China is changing its uh, the, the, its military structure and try and building up uh, its capabilities um, quite um, consistently. And, and so this gap will also be narrowed. It's not kind of overcome, but it will also be narrowed as well. So. So just to put this into into a number there and or in, into rather into phrases and numbers. So the US military spends roughly equal the rest of the world combined. So this is a huge amount uh, it has on its military spending. And it's much more than the uh, than China is investing in, in in its military. And the other thing which is really kind of um 
a real effort for the United States is um, that its, um, its troops are not just within the United States, but in many countries, um, U.S. Uh, military is stationed. Um, often with, with kind of, uh, or normally with the agreement of the, um, of the country and friendly relationships. And so you do know that we have a, a substantial amount of, uh, of U.S. military troops uh, in Japan. Um, and besides the, the fact that we have frequent like incidences which, which are seen critical by local population, um, the, the military presence in the, uh, the U.S. military presence in Japan as well come and seen as necessary for the protection of uh, Japan as well. So overall, there are 60, uh, there are, there are 100, uh, um, um, 60 bases, uh, uh, around the world and uh, presence of the United States in, in around 120 countries. So, which is a huge is, um, uh, reach um, for a military reach. So, so any place in the world, the United States can be relatively quickly um, be on, uh, um, engaged. And that's a very big difference to, to China. It might have a strong military uh, on its domestic uh, ground, but not necessarily having the re same reach as the United States. The other thing is, of course, that um, the United States has an elaborate alliance with many other actors as well, other countries, um, which is uh, which is also unique. Um, so some, most, some of the most powerful economically and but also militarily powerful countries are very close allies of the United States. And therefore, it is also <clears throat> very difficult to over, um, um, to challenge the United States militarily. But also, in terms of um, mobility, it has uh, it has um, several eleven aircraft carriers um, which can go around the globe and uh, and show U.S. presence while China is developing its first um, and um, is is way behind on this kind of global reach. So overall, we can say without going into too much detail, we can say global reach of the United States is much bigger than the global reach of um, the, uh, of China. But the Chinese military strategy is extending considerably in the recent years. So uh, it tries to develop a blue water, but for the blue water navy, so that's like a, a military, a navy military presence, which can be deployed in, in many parts of the world. Um, and it's kind of, um, China is very active in this part. Uh, the other thing is, uh, it, it, it kind of extends its, its rocket and missile uh, technology in order to have more efficient, sophisticated uh, rockets. Uh, also, this kind of re it increases the global reach of, um, of, of China and would be possible to de probably deploy uh, nuclear weapons to, to longer distances. So, so there's lots of um, uh, technology going into rocket technology, as well. lots of um, effort into, um, going into this area. Um, another aspect is the cyber and space warfare. Um, China has been in recent years very active in this, um, building a satellite, um, building its own satellite um, system uh, for independent navigation, but also kind of um, uh, launching rockets in order to kind of show its capability um, how to reach uh, space. And one of the things which we will probably discuss in our last, last class is that lots of um, possibilities are that, that, um, that the next kind of uh, frontier for military conflict will be in uh, the, will be in the, and not necessarily on the on Earth, but rather like in space. That so there is a kind of a new um, uh, uh, race um, starting in in space, where the United States, Russia, but also China is kind of very active, and India for that respect as well. Interestingly, in terms of ground forces, um, the, um, the China is is is, try, is reducing their forces. But then, at the same time, improving its quality and uh, its equipment and its capacity um, for for relocating military uh, goods and 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 um, and, uh, and soldiers uh, rapidly from one part of the country to the other. So the country, as you know, is very big, 
and this kind of deployment is one of the key aspects of its uh, improvement to rapidly kind of move uh, military staff uh, from uh, to, to different parts of the world. We can see this quite well at the moment in the military buildup in uh, in uh, the Himalaya region, where there was a, a recent uh, clash between India and uh, and um, and China, which uh, which escalated. So efforts are taken to to increase the military presence of um, of the Chinese in the region, um, and efficiency is much higher than it used to be. One of the, the strategic issues which maybe China or several strategic issues which China is, is facing is um, first of all, um, its immediate neighbors are not necessarily all very um, um, uh, some of let me say, rephrase this, I'm sorry. Some of its uh, immediate neighbors are suspicious about an increase of the power of Chinese military power. Um, this is due to several reasons. One is that they are worried as well about the domination. They see the economic development of China, and they're worried that their political uh, will will be, uh, will be redu uh, uh, reduced, and that China will try to dominate the region as uh, Merzheimer was, was arguing previously. So this is not necessarily in the same way seen as an advantage. So. If we kind of talk, think back about the Monroe Doctrine, actually the U.S. presence was not seen as a threat um, to most of the, the countries in Latin America. It was rather seen as a as a support um, for its own cause of independence. Uh, in the case of China, this is quite different. So many of the countries are quite suspicious of. Uh, increased power of China, and are wary that this might lead um, uh, to problems. One of the uh, important uh, aspects here is that there are many flashpoints where China is involved in regional conflict and territorial conflict specifically. I mentioned before the border clash between India and and China. That is um, an issue which hasn't been so much in focus in recent years, but uh, the escalation in the last couple of weeks has really led, uh, it kind of put uh, the international land back on it, um, which is pretty, um, yeah, a worrying development um, because both countries are nuclear powers and, and major, uh, major powers in the region, and an escalation of this conflict uh, could lead to kind of um, devastating situations. But there are many other issues. Um, uh, uh, as well, we, we talked already about the Japan-China relations and uh, the territorial issue about uh, uh, Senkaku Island and Daesh uh, in, in Chinese, Senkaku in, 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 in Japanese. Um, but there's also the, the bigger picture of the South China Sea, which we have discussed at length already before, and also the conflict around North Korea. That's one where where um, uh, where. China is all the way also involved, not necessarily kind of um, very much in, in favor of North Korea, but uh, very un, uh, worried that uh, a regime change might actually kind of change its security structure. And uh, we should not forget, of course, the dispute over Taiwan, um, which is um, seen by by um, mainland uh, the, the People's Republic of China as part of its territory. Um, and there is a compromise situation within the international uh, arena where there is no official agreement that, China, that Taiwan is a country, but inofficially it is treated uh, basically as, a, as an own independent country. Uh, we have seen that this can create um, real problems. Uh, for example, uh, in, the, in the in the current pandemic, um, Taiwan is not represented at the at WHO, and therefore cannot get the same level of access to information, and also not the same. And its voice cannot be heard within the within the international community, which is being criticized by uh, by many countries. But this is a consequence of. Uh, the, of China um, claiming that it's the only representative of Chinese people and therefore Taiwan is not allowed to be a member of 
um, um, of the UN organization. Until now, um, most Western countries, uh, um, or all, basically all Western countries go along with this kind of compromise uh, for inofficially supporting Taiwan, but officially not recognizing it as an independent country. This could change in the future. There are certain issues um, which become, uh, which are, um, uh, which are, uh, which might alter this fine balance between uh, um, this fine balance in the international system. One thing is a more assertive policy towards uh, the People's Republic of China might uh, also lead to a bolder um, uh, um, uh, action on Taiwan. So, it's, so the United States might actually kind of take the steps to recognize Taiwan as a country uh, more strongly. The other thing is that within uh, within Taiwan, the unilateral dec the move towards the unilateral de declaration of independence, the call was uh, is becoming louder. Uh, one issue here is that um, the, the, the learn from the experience what Hong Kong has at the moment, uh, where its rights get um, get squashed, and um, es essentially we can see that the, that the, the two um, one country two system uh, um, approach is, is is currently failing. Um, so so in a way um, there is lots of worry within Taiwan that the same thing would happen um, to the that, or that any kind of solution with China, with the People's Republic of China, would not be feasible. Uh, and a, a stronger um, voice for independence has been raised, which has been being very critical um, by the People's Republic of China. And uh, stronger warnings have been 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 made, um, including uh, being more assertive militarily. So that's actually one of the conflicts which might become quite important in uh, in, the, in the region and quite explosive in this matter. Um, so, so just to talk about these flashpoints, that means that um, surrounding countries are in are not necessarily in uh, trusting uh, um, uh, China and uh, are not ne necessarily welcoming any kind of expansion, which might make it harder for China to actually. Um, kind of proceed in this direction. And, okay, so of course I mentioned already the technological lead of the, of the Chinese, uh, of the US military. Mm. <clears throat> but I wouldn't overstate this because of course um, technical knowledge is existent within, <clears throat> excuse me, within China and uh, this can be bridged, and the longer it, uh, the, um, the Chinese race continues, the more equal uh, the countries will be on the, on the technological front, very likely to be on the technological front. Um, we have to kind of, um, one issue which we really have to talk about, and this is about intention, Chinese intention. Because if you ask Chinese officials, and also if you generally talk about it, um, China always claims that it's not seeking hegemony, that it doesn't want to demo uh, the, um, uh, uh, dominate the region or the globe, for that matter, that it wants to be collaborative, and that it wants to actually kind of get economic benefit, etc., and not necessarily kind of dominate, uh, be a dominant actor. And so, in a way, um, it emphasizes this idea of peaceful rise and peaceful development, saying that China wants to become uh, wealthier and has a very strong economic uh, uh, base, and it wants to, of course, kind of use it uh, in a way um, to develop itself and also develop maybe other countries. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily need to be a threat for the rest of the world because um, their, their intentions are peaceful and more um, harmonious, not hegemonic and dominating. And that is a really important point, because if we kind of talk about Mertheimer's idea of uh, changes in the power structure, then any kind of situation would become like where there is 
one actor is becoming more powerful, would necessarily lead to a conflicting behavior. Um, but maybe the intentions of China are not at all to kind of dominate, but rather to kind of um, really just develop. And it's really hard to kind of, or, or maybe not, uh, not necessarily fair to tell a country to, to not be able to economically develop because it would be too powerful in the, within, the, within the world and therefore it should not kind of uh, uh, develop itself. Having said that, um, there are kind of considerable questions about um, the Chinese intention of whether they want to have a peaceful rise or whether there is um, the intention to have a more dominant uh, Chinese uh, uh, position. The first thing uh, which I would like to mention there is um, the domestic issue. So if you look at different regions within China, the, the, the uh, Xinjiang, Uyghur region, uh, Tibet, also Hong, the situation of Hong Kong, we do see that um, there is a very strong uh, domination of Beijing over the will of the different regions. And um, the say of these regions is, is, is uh, neglectable. So uh, within the domestic arena, we can uh, notice um, that there is not this kind of uh, pluralistic idea. The pluralistic ideas are not kind of very uh, welcome. And so the question, of course, is like, why would if China is is, is very um, centralized and authoritarian behavior on the domestic level? Why would it be very different on the international level? The other thing is that we see a much in recent uh, years, um, definitely in recent months, we see a much more assertive behavior of, um, of uh, China uh, uh, government. We can see this in the escalation of the conflict between India and China. We can also again see this with the current situation in Hong Kong. Um, there have been increased threats against, um, against Taiwan and generally um, a more aggressive behavior um, towards Western countries uh, from, the, uh, from China shows that maybe it is not necessarily the, the clear intention of, uh, of the Chinese government to only uh, kind of rise peacefully, but maybe once the country is powerful enough, it will use its power to be more assertive. However, we do see a problem in this kind of thing because there's a very big uncertainty over the, um, the ideas of the country, which cannot be necessarily easily re be resolved. So uh, there's one worry which, is, which is, has been voiced by Joseph Nye is that if you kind of think too negative about a rising power like China, uh, then, um, and you're kind of acting too conflictual, then it will become a self fulfilling prophecy. So the aggressive action towards the country be, uh, might lead to counter aggression and therefore you actually are in a conflictual situation which not necessarily needed to be the case. Um, so careful assessment of the situation is really important and maybe the strategy which is currently used by the United States is not necessarily um, very fruitful in this way because it kind of escalates uh, tensions rather than um, than decreasing them. So that um, brings me to this kind of last term. Uh, the last point is whether will um, this uh, specifically uh, Trump or President Trump's America's first strategy uh, change the course of Chinese rising. So in a one way we could say like okay, uh, President Trump is really maybe the first president in in, in the recent. Um, uh, two decades uh, who is taking on China more actively and kind of uh, challenging the uh, Chinese position. Um, but at the same time, uh, that might lead to, uh, that, that might lead to increased conflict and we see this uh, um, at the moment with the, with the trade war. Um, but uh, some scholars also argue that the weak domestic uh, policies or Trump's kind of domestic policies are not necessarily and its, its behavior towards its uh, 
its allies are not necessarily kind of strengthening the position of the, uh, of the United States, um, but rather weakening them. And that combined with a more aggressive stance towards China leads to a, a power vacuum, which might be used by China to, um, to extend its position. We have seen this um, um, uh, several times where uh, Xi Jinping tried to advocate that China is for multilateralism, is for economic uh, multilateralism, and wants to go away from this um, this uh, bilateral deal uh, the United States is, is trying to, to strike with individual countries, which often are seen as a bullying uh, tactic. So, so there is an incentive of, uh, of China to kind of sweep into, um, into the power vacuum, um, which, which has been created by the United States. Having said that, it's also very difficult to see how this current pandemic is changing the, the economic structure, the economic structure within China, the economic structure within the United States, and also the international um, um, situation. So it might be that um, um, that uh, once we come out of this pandemic, uh, another economic crisis might might hit, and um, that might lead to a completely different international system. Uh, one last point, which we should raise there, is actually the the, the consequences from the elections in the United States, which happened to to be in November this uh, this year. So the president, like the, the current U.S. strategy, is heavily dependent on um, the, uh, the 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 or heavily pers uh, personified by the, uh, the current president, uh, President Trump. Uh, if there would be any change in the presidency, that might actually also lead um, to a different perception and a different assessment of the relationship between China and the United States and uh, the United States and the rest of the world. So we can expect that this might actually lead um, to a different situation altogether. Okay, um, I leave it here, but you can actually kind of um, think a little bit further about this, what you think um, the current U.S. strategy is, um, um, is what impact it has on the, on the rise of, uh, of China overall. Um, also write down this, this kind of ideas on the Padlet side. I'm very happy uh, to read about it. Um, the last part I want to very quickly go over, but just kind of say like where we had historic cases of challenging the United States. Um, um, and what we do see with, especially with, uh, um, in the beginning of the 20th century, Germany and Japan's strategy of expansion, which were, which were very much kind of based on conflictual behavior, aggressive stance, um, towards, uh, uh, um, towards its opponents, which essentially led into two world wars. Um, and especially Germany um, kind of uh, was was very aggressive in this in this behavior, and and it led to a devastation of Germany, but also devastation of um, of uh, Europe and and the world at large. Um, so in a way, this was a conflictual behavior, which really uh, led uh, towards ruining the country um, and the global economy. Um, if we kind of think about the, the time period afterwards, the Soviet Union's arms race with the United States led also to severe problems in terms of bankruptcy and dissolvency, especially um, on the side of the Soviet Union. It was very expensive for the United States as well, but especially on the Un uh, Soviet Union. It led actually to the collapse of the, of the political system and the Soviet Union overall. If you think about the Japanese economic uh, re um, rise in the 1980s, it was also seen as a challenge by the United States, but it actually ended uh, by an economic crisis in the 1990s. And uh, since then, it's, uh, the United, uh, Japan is not seen as a, only seen as an ally, not as a competitor towards the United States. And just in, in, in strong uh, um, difference to this, uh, Britain was actually kind of 
always you know, a very close ally to the United States and rather accommodated uh, itself together with the right. Um, and therefore, this kind of cooperation didn't lead uh, to a conflictual behavior. If we kind of um, if we kind of think about why would we kind of could we argue what kind of arguments are there that Chinese right might be peaceful and that actually it is not as conflictual as we as we kind of laid out by Mertheim as I guess in the very beginning. Uh, the first thing is if we kind of talk about it in terms of Eigenberry, China is actually um, benefiting from the existing international order. Um, it is kind of well incorporated in the United Nations, a member of the Security Council, also in the um, World Trade Organization. It's an important actor. And it, in, in recent years, especially, uh, China emphasized multilateralism right, quite a, a lot and said, like, it's really interested in uh, kind of working within this international. However, having said that, there has been a quite a frustration about um, about um, institutions uh, where China has an unproportionately low uh, kind of impact on. So, for example, in the IMF, um, uh, the, the the rights of, of of China are not at all in line with its economic power on the global stage. Mm. So we have seen that um, China. It makes efforts like with the AIIB, the Asian Investment and Infrastructure Bank, to to develop own international organization institutions, which which might be followed where China might be followed by other actors. So maybe China is not necessarily kind of changing the international order per se but it might kind of change the institution. What we also do see, and that was one of the criticisms in the World Health Organization, is that um, China makes an effort to kind of have access to power within the decision-making of these organizations, um, maybe by, by a personal alliance with certain, with certain actors. And so we do see that China is more and more kind of taking um, taking action to increase its power position within the institution. But um, I generally perceive that China is aware that expensive policies um, pro produce kind of a threat uh, to other actors and therefore are hesitant to use these kind of openly expansionist uh, developments. So, for example, the Silk Road project um, is seen in the United States and in some parts of Europe as an uh, effort of the of the China to be more expansionist. At the same time, this is kind of clearly framed around economic development, and it's uh, kind of framed around benefits for for countries participating in it. And um, so, in a way, it seems less threatening to to other actors because it highlights the economic benefit and not necessarily the the Chinese dominance in, in, in its action. Having said that, um, again, if you take clues from recent development, the more assertive behavior towards uh, Hong Kong shows that maybe if pushed, uh, China is not necessarily so, um, so reluctant to use power if it has it and if it is seriously challenged. So we can see that in, in the situation of Hong Kong, um, the, the, the government in Beijing is not um, considering too much uh, foreign positions and fears uh, about more uh, Chinese uh, um, dominance and is projecting power in a very rather obvious way. So this brings me to the other side, why we kind of think that Chinese uh, rights might not be so peaceful. And the first one is that there has been an unsatisfaction with international order in generally in, in China, because as I mentioned before, there seems to be tilted towards Western powers um, more generally, but more specifically towards the United States, which has been seen as uh, 
unsatisfactory for China. And it tries to kind of change these either by um, changing the, the, the organization or kind of developing counter organization. But at the same time, from the West, um, there is a trust issue with, uh, with China. China has always seen it very critically about, um, about any action it does um, in order to, um, to, to see whether this is to develop some gain and benefit. So just to give you one example, during the current pandemic, actually once it was um, kind of controlled by within China, we have seen that, um, that China was quite helpful with uh, exporting um, uh, PPE and other, other security protection, uh, protection material to several European countries. Uh, generally, thing, things like this um, like, um, were kind of, well, well, we, uh, helped, were seen as helpful and positive within, uh, within the country. But the Europe at large was very critical of this behavior because it, it was always framed uh, in, in a way of ex China exercising power, increasing power, increasing influence within Europe. So it wasn't seen as a, this kind of good deed but rather as a strategic maneuver to increase its power within the country. And so we see that there is a high level of distrust of, of China within the West, and which makes it more uh, harder to kind of have like uh, some peaceful collaboration. And as uh, Joseph and I mentioned, might lead to a situation of self-fulfilling prophecy, where the West doesn't trust and the East and uh, China doesn't trust and so forth. So, um, even though the intentions of both sides is not necessarily conflictual, that we end up with a conflictual situation. Um, two other things which I want to raise briefly. The one is that there are um, China, in order to be this kind of uh, a powerhouse of production, this, uh, the, the workbench of the world, it needs lots of raw materials, which are not uh, necessarily found by own resources but resources around the world. And we have seen like an Africa strategy of uh, China where it becomes very active in order to supply these kind of resources, um, which also again uh, has been, been critical in the, um, in, the, in the United States and, and, and Europe. And so we can see maybe a, a certain level of a competition over raw materials, which leads or sea lanes, which lead to, to, to increased conflict. The last point I want to mention here is uh, internal instability. Um, what we do see is that whenever there is kind of um, criticism about the government's behavior, that the Communist Party's behavior, uh, domestically or from abroad, um, there is a, a, a tendency to steer nationalist mobilization. So kind of um, uh, things along the lines that the Chinese honor has been has been um, a different or um, been, been insulted or that Chinese people have been disrespected, etc. All these kind of na nationalism uh, kind of driving is, is quite receptive on the, on, uh, uh, domestically um, by the Chinese population and been used frequently in recent years by the Chinese government to, um, to co put pressure on external actors. Um, um, what one, one worry about these kind of strategies is that maybe at one point they might not be easily controllable. And so um, this kind of national mobilization can lead to a more national policy and therefore also an escalation of a conflictual situation. Well, the other kind of thing is like, Will the United States actually be able to contain uh, China? Um, and there are kind of very, um, and maybe in the way um, the United States was able to contain the Soviet Union. And the the, the reasons around this is is, is kind of um, it's difficult to see um, how how feasible this is. Um, there are some scholars which say like plain out say like. U.S. doesn't have the ability to actually contain uh, China, and therefore it would not be 
what be possible as a as a strategy. And most time, I might be one of the the, the people who would argue along this line. One other issue, which is very, uh, um, which has been prominent also in, in recent months, is that the US is depending on Chinese goods and, and also um, financing. And so, um, so, in a way, the interdependence is very high and containment might not be possible in this way. Um, on another thing is that US corporations invested heavily in China. And uh, there's a strong interdependence between those two parties, uh, so China and the United States. And that might actually lead um, to a more cooperative behavior. So this kind of interdependence leads towards not necessarily containment, but a more, uh, the willingness to, uh, to, to act cooperatively. Because we have a very different situation um, um, between the Soviet Union and, and the United States where like the ideological changes and the military changes uh, um, were existent, but especially also a far more independent sphere of influence, which we did not have a lot of uh, economic interdependence. And, um, uh, and so it is very different um, situation between the current, uh, current China and the, and the Cold War situation, which we had um, during the uh, with the Soviet Union. So at the end of this kind of lecture, I'm sorry that I leave you puzzled because I kind of uh, put weight on, on several kind of arguments which go in opposite directions. So I'm really interested in what you think about uh, US-China relations in the, in the future. Do you think it will be kind of conflict is inevitable, so it will actually there's no way around having conflict between the two countries. Or do you think um, it's only it's possible, but it can also it can also go either way. It's not something which is necessary, but it, it can, like depending on the actions of the different actors, it might lead to uh, um, uh, to conflict or not. And um, the, of course, the third position is it's actually avoidable. It can be it's possible just to. Um, to avoid um, conflict, ex uh, uh, extensive conflict between the two countries, and maybe with a new U.S. president and then the different stance, uh, positioning of the Chinese government, it will lead to a more cooperative and um, behavior between the two uh, the two powers. So please think about it. What you think is a possible future scenario, and not just in the next two years, but maybe in the next 10, 15 years. Um, so two things uh, um, I want to kind of uh, um, keep in mind there, of course, the unpredictability of the future. What do you think like um, external events like the current pandemic, what kind of imp impact do you think that will have on this, in this relationship? But also kind of maybe think a little bit uh, uh, what I call here uh, on the lines of structure versus choice. So we have some structural arguments like Merzheimer's argument that because the international system is structured in a certain way, any challenge to the United States needs to be conflictual. Or we have like choice arguments where people say like, okay, at the current US president is very confrontational towards China and that leads to, um, that leads to conflict if he wouldn't, or if another president is in charge, this situation might be very different. So kind of taking this, these kind of considerations into the structure with the choice and the unpredictability over the future into your into your argument and then please write it down on the Padlet side if you have the time. I would really look forward to reading this information and know more about your thoughts. So until our Zoom class, I wish you a great time.